Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, episode 26, Image Processing. Take it away, Patrick. All right. I never know who's going to open the show. Then Jason just starts talking. <laughs> we record that part like 10 times. We both breathe in. We go, <gasps> oh, and then whoever, whoever says it first. Yeah. Oh, see, I beat you. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so uh, first I want to talk about a new website. So yeah. um, actually, this is much, much belated, and I, I owe much apologies. My brother was nice enough to buy us programmingthrowdown.com for Christmas. Pretty awesome. And he actually built a, a little website there. So you guys can check that out, programmingthrowdown.com. Yep. Uh, that's spelled. No, I'm not going to spell it. It's too long. <laughs> yeah. Google it. Uh, yeah. ProgrammingThrowdown.com. And so that's going to be our new website. We're going to we're going to start you know talking about that instead of our blog spot, ProgrammingThrowdown.blogspot.com. That's too long. Yeah, we we removed blogspot. We efficiency. Vivisected it. We, okay. We saved you a bunch of <laughs> typing. Congratulations. So, anyways, you guys can check that out, uh, and uh, hopefully that'll be good for us. So onto the news. Yeah. So so we're recording this. Uh, the big news has been Sim City. Oh my gosh, what a fail, man! So I've heard various things. You Wait, probably... but I've heard people saying like it's addictive. Like, oh, you shouldn't play this because you'll lose like hours and hours and days of your lives. Yeah, life. waiting for the server to. Oh you, right? no! <laughs> I think they mean it's that good. Um, but yeah, what I've heard has been uh, uh, that basically. So there's two issues. There's a technical issue, which is that the servers. Um, have a very fixed number of people that they're allowing in. And um, so a lot of people just can't play the game after they bought it, which is kind of sad. Um, another issue is that they are doing microtransactions. So, you know, you kind of build your city up, your people are pretty happy, and all of a sudden, you know, Joe Brown wants to get from his residential district over into the city and he needs a commuter train. What? Oh, that's going to be $2 of real money, right? So they've started this, you know, microtransactions and it just like League of Legends, you end up having to pay five hundred dollars if you wow. want all the content. Uh, or something. Wow! Okay, uh, League of Legends. Is so, pretty so ridiculous. the fundamental issue yeah. here, like to describe it, is that they decided the makers of SimCity decided that they wanted this to be an online game. Right. So even though like a large portion of SimCity has always been kind of focused on single player, and even this game largely is kind of a single player game, mm -hmm. but you have interactions with other people's cities. Um, Online, and then they want to do, they're saying that they do a lot of the processing online. Like, it wouldn't be possible. People are like, oh, just make an offline version. Like, this online version is terrible. And they're saying, like, oh, but an online version is necessary because of the amount of modeling we want to do. And so we want to handle a lot of these things on our servers. Oh, well, that's great in a way. City like, in the cloud. But maybe that's not possible, right? Like, I mean, if it wasn't ready and they didn't kind of expect it, but it's also hard because that launch week, month, or whatever. Everybody is like going to be on at the same time. After right. that, people aren't going to be playing it as much. You know, there's going to be people drop off, and so it goes way down. So, like when launching a product, this is like a common common issue. Aside from the, you know, problems we can talk about SimCity, but like when you launch, like you have to balance this. Like you want to scale up. If you're going to have a really really big launch, like having a lot of servers, that's really expensive, and then you may not need them after that. Right. And so like this balance of like what is the if you design for what peak capacity you can handle, you can't just make that infinite or you'll spend infinite money. Yeah, exactly. So or or even, you know, you should make it elastic, right? So they should have jumped on some Amazon web services or something like that where they could, uh, you know, start off with a ton of servers and as people dropped off, they could, you know. It probably is on Amazon. Well, I, I, don't know, I saw an article report kind of said it was connecting to Amazon servers. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so they'd already be doing that. Um, Apparently not well. <laughs> but yeah, so like, do you think the world is ready? Like, I mean, I think I don't think this is going to be isolated, right? I think this is the wave of the future games, uh, which yeah. are requiring online, not just for DRM, which is a big thing. Like, we've talked about that in the past. Like, oh, what happens when the DRM server's down or not working or yeah. whatever? But those are pretty relatively easy to uh, alleviate most of the problems with, aside from the fundamental issue of DRM. Right. Like, you know, oh, okay, like... Eventually, you could release a patch which disables the DRM if the server goes away. Whether or not they'll do that is a question. Right. But in general, like you can make it that, oh, it only has to check the DRM every month or something, right? Like, oh, okay, fine. Um, but this, like, oh, we're going to do a pair of processing. Like, a lot of the processing is happening in the cloud, and you have a thin client in your house. I mean, this is 
the dream of what 15 20 years ago right yeah. like oh everybody's going to have thin clients we're oh, all going to yeah. be connected to like what massive machines called? in the back end and there was a thing where you would uh, you'd play a PlayStation game over the internet without having a PlayStation uh, uh, there's so there's like, like OnLive which on does live, that that's right but, but that's not just PlayStation games but yeah, yeah so right. I mean this is like the becoming more and more of the future right or you can look at even some of the products coming out like Google with their Chromebook thing right like yeah. mostly Chromebook is a thin client it doesn't do much except for run Chrome yep. and then it depends on you know, the all the Google services in the cloud so I feel like this is uh, the old is new again I wonder if they'll make a Minecraft kind of like this where everyone's playing in one huge world oh that'd be, that'd be pretty awesome griefing would be a problem oh yeah yeah I just go in and just flood your house every day <laughs> but yeah that would be interesting right but you would need a server to do that right like you would have yeah. to have like a legitimate like very scalable big server to right yeah, totally. That's an interesting. Co- we'll see. That's pretty think, awesome. Uh, internet connections aren't that reliable yet in general. And then you have overloading, right? So yeah. I'm, I'm not sure we're ready for this. Yeah, this might be a little too forward thinking. So my news of the day is a uh, news show is Angular Strap. And so Angular Strap is a, is a wrapper that somebody wrote or a set of libraries that gives you bootstrap functionality in AngularJS. And I'll explain all of this. Okay, so, good. Um, Bootstrap is a set of JavaScript libraries written by Twitter, by Twitter, for Twitter, but they open sourced it so anyone can use it. And uh, it handles a lot of things like modal dialogues. So, you know, if you're in the browser, uh, you know, if you're writing some code for the browser and somebody, you know, clicks on login and you want to give them sort of like what feels like a new login window that they can't get out of when they put in, you know, their username, password and stuff like that. That's called a modal, modal, M-O-D-A-L, dialog. And, uh, you know, Angular uh, Bootstrap has a way of just doing this. Like, you just say modal and then pass it some, you know, text and things like that, and it creates one for you. So uh, Twitter has a lot of these libraries that do all sorts of really cool things. Um, and then let's talk about AngularJS. AngularJS is a what's called a reactive um, programming library. So it's pretty cool. You actually you make these declarative statements like, um, you know, this section of the website will have the person's name. Uh, it's kind of like Prolog. Um, I think we talked about Prolog in an earlier show, but you make a lot of these declarative statements. And then as you change variables, AngularJS sort of just does the right thing to make those declarative statements still true. So for example, if you say, you know, take the person's username and put it here on the website, and the person's not logged in, they have no name, it'll just put empty string, right? But then as soon as Patrick logs in, it's going to put Patrick there. Like, you don't have to write any code saying, oh, Patrick's logged in, let's fill in the name. It just does it, right? So Angular Strap is um, all of the Twitter cool, awesome UI bootstrap library, but written in AngularJS. So you can get the best of both worlds. And uh, it's pretty freaking awesome. I have a link. You guys should definitely check it out if you want to do anything on the browser. So have you used this yet? I have actually used both of these. I haven't used Angular Strap, but I've used Angular JS, and I've actually used Bootstrap with Angular JS, where I had to do the glue part oh. myself. Did so, you write this? No, I did not write oh, okay. Angular Strap. I, well, technically, I wrote you know one percent of it, uh, but but they don't know that, and uh, they rewrote it. <laughs> <laughs> but you should have uh, open sourced your one percent. Yeah, it's true. They uh, they are the ninety nine percent. They have uh, <laughs> they have uh, they've done this work for you, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel as I did. And uh, it's definitely worth so. Be better out. than Jason and download this. <laughs> yeah, check this out. Do yourself a favor and do me a favor and uh, check out Angular Strap. All right. Well, time for tool of the show. You're up first. All right. My tool of the show is uh, I've been doing a lot of reading lately. Uh, ever since we started Book of the Show, actually, I've been doing a lot more reading. And it's <laughs> I been thought you were going to say since kindergarten. <laughs> yeah. Since we did Book of the of, uh, Show and Tell, I've been, anyways. So I'm doing a lot of reading lately, both to you know have good books to share with you guys, and also just because uh, it's kind of fun. So uh, uh, to do this reading, I've used Moon Reader Pro, which is a pretty awesome Android app. I'll tell you guys about it. It, um, it synchronizes what page you're on with, uh, well actually, so if people are familiar with Google Reader, which uh, where you can you know, download books on, from the Google Store, and then it, if you have, you get the book on the tablet and the phone, and it keeps it in sync. So Is it Kindle, Kindle Reader does this? 
Oh, really? So if you read on the desktop, it'll keep your page. Yeah, so it synchronizes what page you're on across your devices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this does that, but for arbitrary PDFs, EPUBs, like oh. any file format you want. So um, it's pretty amazing. Um, also, a really cool feature I like that the Adobe Reader doesn't have is um, it'll let you invert the colors. So I really okay. don't like <laughs> I really don't like black text on a white background when the device is lit. Like on a Kindle, it makes sense, but for a device that has an LCD panel, it really uh, makes sense to have white text on black. I don't think I've ever tried this. Oh man, you should totally try. Okay. So they have a free version, which is Moon Reader, not Pro, Moon Reader <laughs> free. Um, try this out. Invert the colors. Read white text on black background. I guarantee you'll love it. And then this app was only when I bought it. It was only I think two dollars. Do they have totally this on, worth on iOS? Um, I don't know. We can check. Okay, yeah, but I'll basically, it. Uh, it uses Dropbox, so you need a Dropbox account, and it actually synchronizes your books and uh, what page you're on using Dropbox. So um, I'm assuming yeah, it doesn't everyone look like has. It's on, a brief search doesn't reveal that it looks like it's on iOS. Ah, uh, so. bummer. But uh, if you have an Android device, um, definitely get Moon Reader Pro. Best $2 you've ever spent. So. Be oh, best. Wow, that's lofty statements. Here. I know. That pack of gum has nothing. What about when you were on Moon you know, Pro. so dying of thirst in the desert and that guy came by and sold you a bottle of water? He charged me $3. Oh, okay. I know. It was well. brutal. But that was the best two-thirds of uh, $3 <laughs> I've ever spent. Okay, right. I'm sorry. That was terrible. So, All right, so mine, so <laughs> yours is Android. Tool mine, show? mine will be iOS, but mine's not a utility. You're I, the I yin to my yang. I use the tool very loosely in this. Like, it doesn't have to actually be... So this is Space Team. This is a game. Okay. This is not a single-player game. It's a multiplayer game, but it's local. <clears throat> I, I can't really show you because you don't have it, oh, or else bummer. we could play it. But then people would be like, what's going on? <laughs> so what this is, is it simulates you and the other people in your room. Um, so you, you are together. You need to be together. And you are on the same Wi-Fi. Okay. And so it does a Wi-Fi link between your devices or whatever. And it simulates that you're all flying a spaceship. Oh. But your spaceship is having problems, lots of problems. So that's kind of the like theme, right? But that's in reality, cool. what it is, is on your device, it gives you kind of a control panel with various different uh, knobs or sliders or switches or push buttons or meters or whatever. And they're named very crazy things, right? So like the discombobulator, you know, switch, the amazingness slider, like named <laughs> okay. literally like this, right? And every person's device has different different control pieces. Okay. So you don't, nobody's is the same. And then across the top of everybody's screen comes a different thing that needs to be done to continue flying the ship. But it may or may not be on your screen. So mine might say, move the pretty meter to six. Well, I look, I don't have pretty meters, so I have to shout, somebody move the pretty meter to six. Oh, but they don't know that they have but to move. They it. don't know because theirs says something else. Oh. And so I'm like, move the pretty meter to six. Move the pretty meter. And you're saying something at the same time. You're saying, <laughs> move, move, the, move the moon disk to seven. Move the moon disk to seven. <laughs> or, or sometimes it's words like, turn the space heater to cold. You know, or something <laughs> yeah. like it could be anything, right? Like, and so you're all shouting different things. <laughs> that's so. Good. And sometimes you'll realize you're shouting something that's actually you need to do. <laughs> you'll hear somebody else, and you have to like acknowledge it so the person can stop. But you kind of know because it'll go away. Oh. It has like a little timer. So oh. like the longer you take, if you take too long, like your spaceship kind of has problems, right? Yeah. So then eventually stuff begins to go wrong. So like the levels get harder. So if you keep going, like it'll stop being words and being symbols. So oh, like instead geez. of it'll just be like this weird triangle with a circle around <laughs> it symbol like push that button move that <laughs> yeah it's really it gets harder right but then also uh, if you do bad um, your panels will break so like uh, green ooze might start coming down over the things and it's hard to see or they might start uh, dangling down from their screws <laughs> and swinging back and forth and, and you, you need to, to kind of like pin them back in or try to tap them as they're swinging um, so that's so it's like really crazy and fun and you typically die like really quickly. But um, if you want to have like a blast, I recommend this for you know people who are not in an area which needs to be quiet and uh, you know everybody's kind of goofy and in the same same mood. But as like a party game, this is a lot of fun. Yeah, that's amazing. I'll so, have to check that out. I forgot about that, but I had played that over Christmas uh, with my family, and that oh, was nice. that was a lot of fun. So, um, <laughs> but everybody else was like, "What are you guys doing?" And the more people, it actually gets kind of harder because then it's like, but it's funnier. Because, you know, people are screaming. Anyways. And I, I think it, so it's free. So that's really good. Oh, wow. And then um, I think you can buy, like, they have, like, additional features and missions oh, and that I kind see. of stuff or whatever. But, I, I mean, for me, it was just kind of a good couple times to play it. Yeah, it sounds amazing. So. I'm going to have to check this out. So it's not for Android. I just looked it up, unfortunately. Aww. But maybe there'll be a... Maybe someone from someone in the audience can look for a Moon Reader Pro for iOS variant 
and a space team for Android, and we can be complete. <laughs> there um, we go. All right. All right. So it's time, it's time for, for book of the show. Show, 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 show. So my book of the show is um, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? I don't know, did I? <laughs> uh, spoiler alert. No, I'm just kidding. I won't tell you. But um, it's by Philip K. Dick, and uh, it was pretty good. Um, it Basically, it's uh, about sort of this futuristic world where they can make um, androids so real that it's hard to dis like distinguish them from people. And uh, it sort of gets into this whole, you know, at what point, you know, is an android a person and this per there's this person who's actually a bounty hunter who goes around killing androids that have um, sort of that have done certain things uh, without spoiling too much I've, let's say malfunctioned in a certain way and uh, along the way he sort of starts to really care for these androids and he realizes that they are starting to develop like human like qualities and it's a pretty cool book I liked it Thought it was pretty fun, and uh, you guys should definitely check it out. So this is the book that the Blade Runner movie was loosely based on. That's right. If you've seen Blade Runner, um, supposedly neither, neither Patrick nor I have seen Blade so Runner. So I've seen parts of it, like I'm familiar enough. I think it's like the general, the like that same theme, like a yeah. bounty hunter who like is trying to determine if these things he finds are androids or humans, right? Like right. This central theme and some other kind of sub-themes is shared, but the actual story, I believe, is is quite different. Like, gotcha, you're not going to gotcha. find the same scenes, like, you know, from the book or not in the movie and vice versa. That's, oh, that's kind of my understanding. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty interesting. He administers a test to determine whether it's an android or a human. And uh, the test by itself is kind of interesting. Uh, the, yeah. The, I don't want to so, say anything because yeah, we won't spoil, spoil it. stuff. Yeah, we're always worried about spoiling. We won't do that this time. But uh, you guys this should time. definitely <laughs> check it out. <laughs> I'm sure we've spoiled other things in the past. So what is your book of the show? Mine is Foundation, book one of the Foundation series. By Isaac Asimov. Mm -hmm. So actually, now I was trying to look. I don't remember how many books are in the series. There's a lot. So yeah, there's actually there's three. But then it's sort of like Star Wars. It's exactly oh, is like that Star what it Wars. Is? Oh, okay, so it's a trilogy. Three, he wrote then... four through six, and then he wrote one through three later. But you can actually skip one through three and still oh, be okay. Oh, I didn't know that's how it was. So I've read. I don't know how many books in this series. I think the trilogy the first released trilogy or mm -hmm. whatever and then i've read various other books which are also in it so i'm kind of confused now and i i generally know the story arc but kind of not really gotcha. so it's confusing but i haven't read them all but i've read this this book and i believe i remember what happens this is a very intriguing science fiction book where it kind of goes under this idea of like um which is classical and um that it is actually true in history that people tried to say if you could measure kind of like all the variables of something could you predict what was happening in the future right so if you had like some isolated system and you knew the measurement of everything is like is it deterministic or is it still like oh you don't know what's going to happen because there's some source of kind of randomness yeah um and so this is like a classic pursuit of uh, philosophy i guess i don't know what exactly field it falls into and so um this kind of explores an, a notion of that where like if you could do this, what's called psychohistory, so like measurements about society, could you come up with statistical models that say whether or not certain actions are likely? And gotcha. so um, it's about this guy who is in the Galactic Empire, which is kind of like seen as this all good thing and has been ruling for like 12,000 years. And there's this guy who develops this psychohistory and begins to kind of understand that bad things are going to happen. Uh, um, and he's on a quest to try to stop it. And then without spoiling anything, I mean, that happens like really early in the book is you essentially figure out that he's like, uh, you know, maybe there isn't a way to stop it. So if there's not a way to stop it, is there a way to kind of like make it less worse? Right. You know, right. And what steps would you do? And so he tries to make all these measurements and kind of take, take precautions to figure out what, what he would do. And okay. uh, that's what the book's about. But it's really interesting. I mean, it's been around a while. So some of these themes, I never know this when I read books that are kind of older. Like if the themes in them were original to them or reshared or yeah, common. I was wondering because like I read thing. other books and I'm like, oh, I've seen this before. I'll predict the outcome of the book. Yeah. And it's because like, oh, it's because this was the original source of that idea, but it's been rehashed so many other times. Yeah. There was a movie you know. with, I think, Nicolas Cage, right? Where either him or his daughter, somebody could know what was going to happen and he went uh, to a plane crash before it happened and is that TV tried series to, or a movie yeah i think i remember movie. seeing this okay. yeah he was saving i didn't see the movie but i saw the previews plane. yeah yeah so so this is a this is a classic story but uh this is but maybe he was a origin of it yeah this is the I best incarnation of it a lot of people have recommended this book and okay so. yeah foundation as Asim isaac asimov it is good isaac asimov right, we're probably saying that wrong but that's okay yeah poor guy <laughs> all right so on to our discussion yeah. image processing 
image. Wait, did you say this at the thing. beginning in the lead-in? I don't remember now. I, uh, I maybe not. Maybe this did. is a surprise. I think I did. Okay. Anyways, so the uh, so we're talking about image processing, and uh, it's pretty timely considering there's all this talk in Congress about drones and crazy. Uh, you know, oh, I didn't make that connection. I mean, I guess, and okay. Things like that. Oh, actually, I posted in the programming throwdown community. That uh, we're going to be doing image processing. Oh, did you? Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. So people are people so, are doing their pre work. Then. Yeah, yeah. So people can ask us some questions, even though it's one way. Okay. Um, oh, wait, what? <laughs> okay, I don't know what that. All right, doesn't make sense. Okay, anyways. anyways so, so to talk about what image processing is, like from a high level. So I actually struggled with this. I was thinking like, oh, what's the best way to describe it? Because it kind of involves many related things, and that they all right. start with an image, but you kind of from there it goes into like whole fields which are you know kind of under the banner of image processing so wikipedia i just stole what they wrote because <laughs> nice. i thought it was pretty good so they yeah, divided they a really good job they divide it into three categories which uh, some of them I, I might name them different or maybe not but it's it's as useful a categorization as any yep so first is image processing just image processing so this is you start with an image and you get an image yep so, so for example if you want to say uh blur an image Mm -hmm. What you end up with is a blurred version of your original image, but you uh, you still end up with an image. It's just been transformed. Right. Or you know you want to find even higher levels. Like oh, I want to find I want an image that shows me where the edges in the original yep. image are. So things that basically produce some sort of image on the output that's been processed in some way. From it. And maybe it's just the same image. Maybe that's like the, <laughs> oh yeah the ultimate the, uh, process. Okay. So the second one is image analysis. Yep. So image analysis are where an image comes in and then some kind of measurements come out. So for example, maybe you're interested in what's called the edge density of the image. So what percentage of the pixels are edge pixels, right? So in this case, an image is coming in and just a number between zero and one is coming out. Um, you mm -hmm. might be interested in um, other things like, for example, the uh, saturation of the image. You might be interested in how much contrast there is. Maybe you want to increase the gain based on, on what the image looks like. And so, yeah, but like it doesn't that. have to just be a, a single number, though. Like, I put into here things like a histogram. Oh, yeah. So a histogram is like you go, so like, let's talk about, oh, we actually, this is a good point to talk about this, so different kinds of image. So you might think about immediately about like a color image, right? But a color image is really a, a case of black and white image, but you have three of them. Yeah. For a red, one black and white, essentially one grayscale image, which oh man, I'm I'm mixing up the terms. Okay, let's try. Okay, so start. Let's start with this simple. Let's like do a simple image case. representation. Yes, image so representation. Okay, you go. Have, you go first. You have binary images, which means a pixel is either black. Wait, or what's white. a pixel? You got. I mean, we got to. Okay. So you have a grid. Yeah, you have a grid of pixels. Each pixel represents some quantile of photons or something anything yeah it's true image really can be anything but if you're taking it if you're talking about an image that you took with a camera or something like that each Which is pixel, a whole other discussion but go ahead <laughs> each pixel is sort of you know a pool of photons over time it's a measurement is. it's just a measurement yeah so um so you can have a binary image where each pixel is just a one or a zero and that binary image could be a result of some threshold some logic there or you know, who knows right um, you can also have a grayscale image, which means that each pixel is somewhere between completely white, which is usually represented as 1.0, or if you're looking at an 8-bit number, this would be 255, the biggest number, right? Or a completely black, zero, or somewhere in between. So that's a grayscale image. Um, a color image is actually represented as three channels. Three so, grayscale images. Yeah, three gray. So one way of doing it is RGB. This is what you know your computer monitor, for example, does. So uh, your LCD panel actually has uh, you know, a red, a green, and a blue uh, light right next to each other. Or actually, this would be an LED panel. It would have a red, green, and blue light that are very small right next to each other. And then by dialing each of those three in some combination, it can create any of the colors that you see on your LED TV. Um, so you can actually, in image processing, you can take that apart and just look at the red channel, the green, or the blue channel. But it turns out that there actually are other ways to do this too. One way is you can look at HSL, which is hue, saturation, and light. And uh, there's kind of trade-offs to doing these these different techniques. But well, so so you, wow, we're getting we can get <laughs> a lot of tangents here. A lot but yeah, so I mean, there's so RGB, red, green, blue is color. So because right. you can take red, green, and blue. And represent any other color, right? With some combination, if you have infinite adjustments in each of the three, you can represent any other color. So those three work. 
but there are other color spaces which also work. But even ones which are colors so like cyan, magenta, and yellow. Oh, right. these ones also are you know colors that we see with our eyes. It's just another color, but they're you know also a mix of them can create. And so like that's useful depending on what your end result is going to be. You may want to do that because it's better for printing. So right. printing is typically done not with red, green, and blue as lights are, but with cyan, magenta, and yellow, and sometimes black. But that's just <laughs> kind of like a, a bonus thing. But cyan, magenta, and yellow. And so, like, that's just, you can transform from one to the other, though. There's a, essentially a function right. which will map from one to the other for you. But yep. then what Jason's talking about, HSV, H, S, and V aren't colors. Right. So you kind of kind of change your mind around. It's three numbers, but they're not colors. But they can still represent all the same colors as RGB. But with those three values, you can represent any color. Right. But they're not colors themselves. That's right. So, so let's talk about them briefly. So um, hue is actually effectively what color you want to display. So whether it's red, green, yellow, blue, etc. That's the hue. The, the value is the amount of light coming in. So as you increase the value, the pixel gets more and more close to white. And if the value is 100%, the hue doesn't even matter. The pixel is just going to be white. And then uh, saturation is the hardest one to explain and basically I even have a hard time just even visualizing it, but uh, the important thing about saturation is that it, um, it it's sort of one of these things that stays relatively constant. So even as the light passes over an object, the saturation usually stays pretty much the same. And so HSV is actually used a lot in image processing because it has some really nice properties. Like for example, if you want to do edge detection, you can do it just on the V channel. Right, mm -hmm. and so that usually is pretty significant. Or if you talk about, so so we already kind of getting way off topic, but it's okay. <laughs> um, so if you want to talk about like, oh, you want to do photo processing. So like I took pictures of my kid and I wanted to change it, right? So if you just are only able to edit the red, green, or blue, we call them channels, just meaning one of those sets of numbers, all the red, all the green, or all the blue together, that is limited in what you can do, right? So a single adjustment in that channel, like make all, multiply all the green values by, you know, 0 0.8. Right? There's limited, I can't necessarily do all of the adjustments I want. Right. Versus if I had also the ability to edit the saturation value, right? That may mean altering all of the red, green, blue values, right? But I'm only having to alter one channel in the HSV image. So transferring between them can be interesting. So where we before we got off, we were talking about making measurements. So we have this grid of numbers. So like let's just take a grayscale mm -hmm. image and you have a bin and you want to say something about the image as an analysis, so you talked about like various measurements you want to take, but sometimes it's a series of measurements like histograms. So histogram is like not just images, but in general is used where you take a range and you make buckets. Yep. So if you had, so in the in a simple example, if your grayscale was zero to 255, you could have 256 buckets. And then you just go through the image and every time you encounter a pixel, you take the value of that pixel and you increment the counter for that bucket by one. Right. Starting at zero and you count them all up. And then if you graph those numbers at the end, so for each bucket, or just write them out, each bucket, how many you have, it gives you an idea of where the content in your scene is. Like, oh, it's really, really bright, then you know, you're gonna have a lot of numbers in 253, 254, 255. Mm -hmm. If it's really, really dark, you might have a lot of zeros and ones. You know? And what you wanna see there to best utilize the space of your image in some operations, you wanna see that it's kind of level across the whole thing. Because that right. means you're using all of the possible numbers to the the best of your ability. Right. Like so. To, so to Patrick's point, if you have say a camera, um, what your camera is constantly doing is it's taking a histogram of the uh, of the image that it's seeing at the moment, and if the histogram is you know completely dominated on the right side, so if By almost white. all the numbers are white, uh, you know almost all the numbers are you know close to 1.0 or close to 255 and 8 bit then your camera will actually um, lower the, I think, the exposure. Is that right? Well, it, or it's a complicated because there's Patrick a whole... Patrick goes a lot more about let's cameras not, let's It'll try to make the image darker. Let's That's just say right. that. So the camera is constantly calculating the histogram and then based on the results of that histogram, trying to allow less photons into the bucket next time around or more until the histogram falls somewhere in the middle. And so that's why when let's say you have a camera or you're recording a video and you're in a dark room and then all of a sudden you walk out your front porch, 
boom, like everything's super bright and the camera is just, all it sees is just this white flood. But then that histogram gets calculated and starts getting shifted over and then it starts to see, oh, you're on the street or something so like this, that. So this brings up the reason for doing this and this is uh, something you run into over and over again in all the image processing is that fundamentally you're trying to represent something which is for most intensive purposes, infinite in scale. So like, you know, there's, and you can have all the way from zero photons, which is black, black, you know, one photon up to like, I don't even know, tri what is trillions of photons fall on a cell? Like, I don't know At how some many point you get photons blinded. are fell. Like you just, I mean, there's a huge scale, yeah. right? Like it could be any number in there. And yet the camera's forced to kind of pick somewhere in there to say, you know, here's the, the darkest one I want to represent and here's the brightest one I want to represent. Right, and your eye does the same thing too. I mm -hmm. mean, by by shrinking your iris or making it bigger, yep, right? Like exactly. your eyes dilate and, and contract, right? That, that is your eye trying to let less light in or yep. more light in. Yeah, so when it's a very dark room, your iris increases, and so this allows more photons to hit the part of your eye that's used for image processing. When it's very bright out, your, uh, your pupils shrink, and then this causes less light to hit that spot and so you're able to do sort of the same computation. So, But it's fundamentally a limitation because we don't have eye sensors. We don't have sensors which can detect the whole scale right. all the way down from zero photons black all the way up to whatever surface of the sun bright, right? <laughs> yeah. Like we don't have something that can hold that much data all at once and even if you did you run into another problem which is what I want to bring up here is like say you're representing zero to 255. You only have 255 numbers to choose from. But yet, if you're inside a, a dim inside building, all of your numbers, if you try to represent, you know, black hole black and surface of the sun white bright, you know, if you try to represent all of those, all of your data might fall on just one number. Right. You right. know, because you have to you have to adjust. And so a lot of the techniques you run into are people trying to do things to improve the, uh, uh, the fineness of the measurement. Because ultimately, once you take that measurement, that's it. You don't ever get more information, unlike CSI, where you can just say, enhance, oh, God. enhance, yeah. enhance, right? Once you take an image, that's oh, it. Like, yeah. you only have that data. Now, you can do things to make it look better or to pull more information. But ultimately, that's, like, once you take the image or you form the image, that's it. Yeah. So if you only have 255 values, you only have 255 values. So you got to carefully choose... What those map to? Yeah, the CSI enhancing is hilarious. We, we watched a lot of those videos on YouTube. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's just ridiculous. I saw one where the person actually saw the killer off a reflection off the victim's eyeball. So they were able to enhance off this person's eyeball just one pixel and somehow create a whole another image. And it just, it does not work that way. There's, there's two limitations. One limitation is the one Patrick talked about where in the end you're, yeah, your your values are distributed into these buckets. There's another limitation, which is that the pixel size. Resolution. Right? Yeah, the resolution. So, you know, photons are collected in these buckets, and the buckets are, you know, dependent on your hardware. And then each bucket can represent one pixel, or there's, you know, there's some cleverness that they do there. But for the most part, yeah, the res there's no way to increase the resolution once you've taken a picture. Right. I mean, you can do some... You know, you can increase the size of the image and then try to interpolate the pixels that, that aren't there, but uh, you'll never be able to... Yeah, enhance. but you're not creating new information. <laughs> right, yeah. right. We should probably talk sometime about cameras. This is actually really fascinating, right? But uh, to try to avoid that topic, yes, resolution. You have one measurement of a, in space and then one measurement in essentially brightness, color, intensity, depending on what you're, what you're yeah. using. So the last one is image understanding. Yeah, and so this is where you know an image comes in, and then what comes out is you know lion prairie or something like that, right? So you uh, you actually take the image and you convert it, you you transform the model from a model of pixels to say a model of text, or maybe even a model in some other uh, domain. So you can turn it from an image into a thing, some other thing. Yeah, exactly. So this is so interestingly the way I think about about this one is, and this maybe stuck with the way I took my courses in at the university, but. <clears throat> so I thought it's funny. So when you do image understanding or image recognition or a lot of image processing, what you're doing is you're taking, ultimately you had the real world and you somehow captured it through a drawing, a painting, a you know, digital camera, a video camera, whatever it may be, some sensor. You captured something, right? So you captured an approximation of, of the real world, mm -hmm. right? And then when you do image processing, image recognition, you're trying to get back to a model of the real world, yeah. right? And yeah, so you're definitely. trying to take that, that approximation and get back and infer stuff about what happens. So when you look at a pretty picture 
on your screen and you do you know tweaking to it to try to make it look better what you're trying to do is either make it look artistic or make it more like what your eyes saw right. there in the real world and or in image recognition you're trying to get back like I want to model that like I know that those pixels were a cat okay good like good cat then you can go a step further and once you have some sort of representation you can do 3D graphics which is taking a model and trying to get back to making an image. Right, yeah. Which that's is kind right. of like, a, in my mind, that's like the pipeline. <laughs> you have like real world, you know, some sort of sensor, and then you have image processing, trying to get to a model. And then 3D graphics is like taking the model and trying to get back to a, something that looks like what would have been taken with a sensor that would map back to the real world. Yeah, yeah. So or, like it's or a, thinking about it in terms of your brain, you have photons that are hitting your eye, you have image processing in your brain that's turning it into different, uh, you know, your brain actually does many different filters and so it turns into, you know, an edge detection, you know, mask and then several other filters. And uh, then it hits your neocortex, which is responsible to saying, oh, this, you know, this crackle of energy is actually a lion, right? And then you dream and you recreate the <laughs> lion in your dream. <laughs> so yeah. it's kind of amazing. Yeah. Uh, so there's, uh, there's, so yeah, those are the three big things. There's image processing, analysis, and understanding. And we're going to try to cover all of them at a high level. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, we already did kind of, sort of. Yeah. So um, uh, images are really connected to matrices, which um, I think we did a show on MATLAB. If not, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. we definitely did. So go back and check out that show if you're not familiar with matrices and matrix operations, things like that. But uh, in fact, a lot of image processing is done in MATLAB. Um, for this reason. So an image kind of uh, fits naturally with a matrix because an image is just a 2D grid of values and that's exactly what a matrix is. Well, a grayscale one or binary would be, but then a color oh, yeah, would be a, a 3D at matrix. X by Y by layer Channel number channels, yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, matrix, matrix math is really important for image processing. So we, we talked a lot, we already started using things that may not be obvious with there. So we talked about like edge detection or we talked yeah. about blurring. So these things which are kind of effects you do or uh, operations you do on an image, some people might call them effects. It depends on what your domain space is. Mm -hmm. But uh, so if you take these operations, so kind of like the base of that is the convolution. Right. So that so matrix math itself, you if you're talking about like linear algebra, is a lot more about like oh inverse of a matrix and you know m you know uh, matrix multiplying finding the determinant and finding the determinant these kind of things and and you do do those sometimes on small pieces of an image or something but for a lot of image processing you're not talking about that same kind of matrix math right. instead you're talking about slightly different <laughs> matrix math um, and so one of those is the basic one is like an image convolution so this is you have a big image let's say a you know, a, a whopping 20 by 20 image or 32 <laughs> by 32. Let's take an old icon. Oh, man. <laughs> 32 by 32 image, right? And you want to blur what's there. So you want to take what's there and kind of average it into the things around it, yep. right? So one thing is you could write like a little program that like, so for the first pixel, look at all the pixels around me and take an average of that, right? And then set that to the pixel I am. And then go to the next pixel and do the same thing. And you run into the problem like, oh, do you, you need a, a two images, right? Because you need the image that's the input because you don't want to keep blurring against something you've already blurred right? or you might cause problems. So you're transforming from one image to another. So you're kind of updating this in place. But the way they represent that in image processing is this image convolution where you take another matrix, so let's say a three by three, and you put numbers in each of the cells, yep. each of the cells of the matrix, and that represents what you want to, when you overlay that matrix in some portion of the original image matrix, you want to multiply that source pixel by this new value. So in the case of an average, if you had a three by three, you'd want it to be one over nine. Right. So you want to take one over nine times the pixel underneath me and do that for all nine pixels, add them all up together, and then set the pixel where I'm currently at to that value. Yeah, exactly. And then go to the next pixel and do the same thing. Yep. So the big difference between matrix multiplication and image convolution is with matrix multiplication, you know, if you remember, your, uh, if you have, a, say, an X by Y matrix, you have to multiply it with another matrix that's a Y by Z matrix. So in other words, the number of columns in the matrix that you did on the left side of the operation has to be equal to the number of rows of the right. matrix on the right side. And you end up with what's called, this is known as the outer product of the two matrices, right? So in image convolution, it's totally different where 
you are basically you're doing you're taking a three by three window of the original matrix and then you're doing the outer product or the inner product rather of that and this convolution what you call a convolution mask this is what Patrick is talking about the one over nine so you take a small piece of the image and you do an inner product between that and your mask and then you take that result and you put it back in where the center of that window was that mm -hmm. you took out and so you do that for all the possible windows you can cut into that image and what you're left with is a new image with uh, all new values so you can get more advanced though. So this three by three, you know, one nine averaging thing, right? Will produce something that looks a little bit like a blur, but it might not right. be pleasing because, for instance, it, pixel like it, let's say it was bigger, a pixel that's far away is going to contribute exactly the same as a pixel that's really close to the center, right. right? And that that's a problem because that's probably not how that's not how blurs in physics really work. So I mean, and if you want to try to model what would be in the physical world, a blur like looking through something that's blurry, you're going to end up with more what's called a Gaussian blur. Yeah. So then there's a, a something to tell you what numbers to stick in each one of the mask cells so that pixels far away contribute very little and pixels very close contribute a lot. Right. And this pr produces you know, a more pleasing blur. And so you'll see even in Photoshop, there's you know, Gaussian blur this image and it asks you questions. You know, what size of Gaussian blur do you want? What standard deviation of Gaussian blur do you want? Right. And all this affects how much the nearness or farness of pixels contribute to what the value of the destination pixel should be. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot There's a lot going on in image processing. It's a lot of heavy math, but it's also a lot of fun. It there's is. So, cool I stuff. mean, the, the nice thing is you do something, well, with many of these, you do something and you get back some picture you can look at, right? Yeah. Or you get some answer out that's probably wrong, you know, cat and you want a dog or something. <laughs> yeah. but, but, I mean, you get something back, and especially the ones where you get an image out is really rewarding because you can tweak something and see what happened, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah. And so um, we'll do a little bit of a tangent. We're actually going to do a two-part series on AI in the future. But uh, for this episode, you know, there's also a lot of AI in image processing. And we'll kind of gloss over that because we'll cover a lot of it in a future episode. But um, needless to say, uh, you have to do a lot of AI. If you want to do, if you want to detect whether this image is a cat or a dog or neither, um, that's you know fundamentally a, a artificial intelligence or a machine learning project program uh, problem. So um, often the way these techniques work is they convert the image into what's called a feature vector. So imagine all those things that we talked about earlier, like the edge density, um, you know histograms, a histogram of the edge. You can actually do an edge convolution, and now you're left with an image where it's white where there's an edge and black where there isn't an edge. And it's gray where it's not really sure if there's an edge or not. You could take that image and then create histograms of that image. You know, is, is that image really bright? You know, is the histogram far to the right? If it is, then there's a lot of edges in this image. But it's better than having that histogram is more information than just having one number, right? As to like the edge density. So you could take this these edge density, these scalar values, you can take these histograms, do some convolutions, some more histograms, and you end up with just a ton of numbers, but each one sort of has more meaning than a single pixel in an image. So a single pixel really doesn't tell a good story, but a lot of these features in the feature vector kind of tell a story about the image. Um, so many AI techniques will first do a lot of image processing and image analysis to create a feature vector. And then at that point, it just becomes a standard you know, AI or machine learning problem. At that point, it doesn't even matter that you're using images because you've converted the image to some other representation. So um, we'll get to more of that later, but uh, that's why a lot of this image processing is so important is that it sets the groundwork for doing some of that other cool Yeah, I guess stuff. that's good. The first two things we talked about, image processing, image analysis, are really separate and linked together and then they produce something which then is further processed by some, like you said, you know, general machine learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. And it's, but it's the fact that it came from a source that was an image that matters, that makes yep. it image understanding, yep. makes it image recognition. One other part of image processing that's really important is a lot of people say, well, image processing, that's just AI, right? But the reality is um, your eye, so just from a physiological standpoint, your eye and the early parts of what's called your retinotopic map, the part of your brain that 
takes a signal from your eye and just does some basic things to it. Um, that's kind of just the way it is because of biology. And so a lot of image processing is just about sort of capturing the way that biology made us how we are. And so, for example, uh, one common thing in image compression, which image compression is a way to represent an image using non, very little data. You know, by default... Less data. Yeah, by default an image is, as we mentioned, a set of pixels. And you could just store a number, or I guess three numbers of its color, for every pixel. But this is, this is a lot of numbers to have to store. So image compression involves sort of storing coefficients of a function. So you might have some function that's very good at describing almost any image, as long as you set a couple of parameters right. And so image compression is about finding those cool functions and then at that point just using those coefficients for the function to represent the image. So uh, one trick to image compression is the fact that our eyes aren't very good at, at representing blue. So it turns out that light blue versus dark blue, our eyes just aren't good at, at distinguishing the two. Like if, if I gave you two shades of blue and they're very similar, you would have a hard time knowing that they were different. But red, on the other hand, we're actually very tuned for green, red. Green. Both. Red and green. Yeah. So they, um, uh, I think it has to do with like predators or... Yeah, we have people hide. Actually, Patrick is right. Green is the one we're yeah. most tuned to. It has to do with, you know, predators are in the jungle and are, we've been biologically, you know, evolved to be able to pick things out from a jungle, pick the lion out that's chasing after us. Like the ones that saw the lion in the jungle survived and the ones that didn't, th those early humans died. And so what's left are people who are very tuned for green and red. So, um... So, you know, image processing, part of you know, image compression is taking advantage of the way that our eyes and the way that the, our brains work. And so once you've, like, captured a lot of that, then you can do, you know, AI, machine learning, cool stuff on top of it. I think that's an interesting, there is an interesting point there that <clears throat> a lot of image processing is knowing what your ultimate goal is. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is, it's a field that's very ripe with applications because, Sure, there may be, I'm sure there's theoretical stuff that goes on, but a lot of it you kind of relate back to something somebody's trying to do. So like you're saying compression based on the human eye. Well, I mean, it depends on what you want to do with it, right? If you're trying to make certain kinds of measurements, you might not want that. You might want, you know, representing what a camera would see really, really well. Because right. that's, that's what you're true. intending to do. You're going to use a camera to navigate a robot, right? And then so you want the thing that measures yeah. best the scene you're in versus acting most like a human. Yeah, exactly. Just because humans aren't good at representing blue doesn't mean that drone, robot drones should have the same handicap. <laughs> right. So, I mean, but it's interesting because you kind of got to know the, you want to do something better, but you need to have your end goal in mind to figure out what's the best way of doing that yep. or any of these things. So, you know, even blurring. So you might want to blur an image again to help on compression because you want to you know, say like, oh, I want to represent with less. So I'm going to kind of do like a little bit of a blur so that when I subsample the image, when I take only every other pixel, I know that I am not going to just completely lose what was in between. I, I get some of that data. But you might want to do a different blur for that than a blur that just, you know, to make somebody's face look less blemished in a photograph Right. when I'm going to send the picture to my mom, you know, like, oh, I want to apply this blur because it kind of makes the wrinkles look a little bit less <laughs> yeah. noticed because they kind of blend in with the rest of the skin, right? Yep. And so that blur may be a very, very different blur than what you're trying to do when you're trying to do compression. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so a, a big part of image processing is sort of deconstructing how our image system works. Um, you know, many of the applications are sort of to either mimic a human or to augment a human's vision or to those provide are my, some Those are my favorite, augmenting humans. <laughs> augmenting a human in themselves. <laughs> so there so. are, there are uh, a lot of common challenges across this, though. The first is that, I mean, everybody knows the whole megapixel race of cameras and yeah. just in general sensors and the data. But it, it's not just about how many pixels you are, but about uh, the bit depth is what it's called of the right. pixels. So instead of using 255 value, 256 values, for every color, I want to use you know 1024 for every color. Or I want to use you know whatever some outrageously large amount of 
you know, data to represent blue. So I want like a 16-bit image where every channel is 16 bits right. instead of just 8 bits. So I can represent that many more levels in my image. And then if that source data is better, all my further processing is going to be better. But every time you do this, you make your the amount of, if you're going to do, for instance, convolution, the number of times you have to do convolution and the precision with which you have to do it just, you know, gets bigger and bigger. And you run into kind of a squared problem, right? So like yep. if you increase each of the dimensions by two, you really made the size of the image go up by four. So, you know, this is like one of the fundamental issues with image processing is that you end up, as your images get bigger and bigger, you have tons more processing that you have to do. And in a lot of applications, like in robots, a lot of image processing is done, you have a deadline. You can't just sit around chugging for five minutes saying, please wait, please wait, please. I mean, you have like, you have to get some answer about what is the robot seeing? What does the robot need to do? And so you need to be able to do these very large calculations very, very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I think the amount of data is really staggering. I think that a lot of people, it's kind of hard to appreciate it, but I mean, one way to look at it is, you know, I was trying to look this up on the internet, but it's, it's not easy to find out, but there's, so one thing I did find on the internet, there's about 100,000 words in the Oxford Dictionary. So there's 100,000 words that need to be defined, right? So let's say each definition was, how many words would there be in? 10. 10 words in a definition? Okay, so there's a million words in the Oxford Dictionary. Like, like if you were to count how many words in the dictionary. Let's say the average word is three letters long. That's three million letters in the, in the whole dictionary. So that is only, what is the square root of three million? It's like, I don't know, 5,000 or something. <laughs> the point I'm getting at is, yeah, it's about 5,000, maybe 5,500. So if you have an image that's 5,000 by 5,000 pixels, let's just say it's a grayscale image, in that image is enough data to hold the dictionary and all of its definitions, right? The wow. entire dictionary. And people take pictures with 5,000 by 5,000 pixels. Nowadays, cameras can do that, modern cameras. So that's not that big. Right? Yeah. You said, well, you said it was 3 million, right? So yeah. that's 3 million, that's 3 megapixels. That's 3 megapixels. So every time you take, you take a 3 megapixel picture, you're taking, you have enough information there to represent the entire Oxford Dictionary. Well, way more because you're taking it in color and you're taking it yeah, with three higher, times as higher much. bit depth than that. Yeah, so so you know, think about the the scale of the of the amount of data that you're processing that has to be processed. It's massive. Right? So it is really crazy because sometimes you go look at like oh an old text file, like well, I was a really big like I typed a lot of words in this doc file or this you know PDF or whatever you know LaTeX. LaTeX. <laughs> yeah. If you're you know, <laughs> it, you know oh I typed a lot of words here and then you go look at the size and it's like what. <laughs> like yeah. It's so tiny, right? 16, and like 10, one right? image, one image, you know, will easily be, you know, 20, 30 megabytes, 40 megabytes. And that's with compression sometimes, you know? Yeah. And it's like, wow, like this is crazy. And then if you talk about video, so oh, we talked about this. It. So image processing plays a lot with video, but all video is, it, it, so aside from the compression parts of it, mm -hmm. video is just, you know, some regular interval of pictures. Right. So you just have a camera that's taking pictures at some regular interval. So in case of like broadcast TV videos, 30 frames per second, like 29.997 yeah, or whatever. Yeah, 29.97. Um, but you have, you know, 30 times a second, the camera's snapping a picture, snap a picture, snap a picture, snap a picture. Yeah. 30 so times, every second, you have 30 of these. And you, if you're gonna process it in real time, quote unquote, that means to keep up, you need to do, you need to process it in 1 30th of a second. Right. Just really fast. <laughs> yeah. These images can be really big. Yeah, imagine you know, you're a production movie. They're filming a production movie, right? So that's easily going to be three megapixels because it's going to go on a huge TV screen. It's probably going to be many more than, much more than three megapixels. Yeah, I think it's. I think HD TV is about two, like 1080p is what about like two megapixels. Yeah, but what so would it's it be for a theater? 1920 by 1080. I mean, this would be so a 4K? Huge theater. So it's like 4K by, uh, I don't know. I don't know, it's huge. Let's right? call it 10 megapixels. 10 megapixels. <laughs> so, and you're recording 10, you're taking a 10 megapixel, you're taking 30 10 megapixel pictures every second. Well, movies are 24 frames per second. Oh, yeah, that's true. Okay, 24. <laughs> so you're, you're well, capturing... Well, old ones. You're New ones are different. Are they really? Yeah, well, this is the whole Hobbit thing. You didn't hear uh, about that. Okay, uh, anyways, let's skip this because this is a tangent. So, you're taking 24 pictures, each picture holding more than the entire dictionary worth of data every second. So it's just a staggering amount of data. And uh, only now, actually, that where we have the kind of computational power and the knowledge of distributed systems, things like that, are we able to sort of tackle 
videos and do the cool kind of things that we want have been wanting to do so yeah and, and still it's hard like if you've ever done video processing on your computer oh yeah on one it, machine so like at first you're like oh man like i'm using this to edit this video and i'm trying to do trimming it or you know whatever doing various things you're like why does it take so long and then you export it, it's like oh man it's gonna take an hour <laughs> like know. what it's a five minute video and you get kind of mad but then you think about like jason's trying to trying to get us to get a little bit of an <laughs> understanding of how much data it's really, really got to go through. And yeah. you begin to kind of realize why it's taking that long, even on really fast modern yep. hardware. Yeah, definitely. So some other challenges of image processing besides handling all that data is that you are looking at an image. And depending, you know, there are the cases where you have video, but in many cases you're just looking at a single image. And so you might be at a frame where there's a lot of, say, what's called occlusion. So for example, um, you might be trying to build a person recognizer, a person detector. Like, yes, if there's a person in this image, no, if there isn't. And your system does really well when it's, when it's head on. So if it's taking, you know, if you're taking a picture of your brother and he's just like smiling, standing next to a rock or something, it does a great job. What happens all of a sudden your brother turns to his side and then now, you know, you can't tell his arm is just on top of his shoulder in the picture, right? And his other arm is completely occluded, which means a picture, because it's two-dimensional, it's sort of squished his arm uh, behind his body, and you can't even tell it's there. So um, occlusion in image processing is a massive, massive problem. I mean, if your image processing algorithm detected humans by, say, looking for two eyes, now, if the person turns to the side, one of their eyes is occluded. Now your image processing algorithm doesn't work anymore, right? So occlusion and along the same lines, um, orientation. So, you know, even if something isn't occluded, you might look for two eyes and you might look for them to be around the same size. But if a person turns their head to the side 45 degrees, now one eye is bigger than the other, right? And so your algorithm doesn't work. So, well, one eye appears bigger than the other. Oh, that's right, yeah. No, actually it grows. As, oh, as you turn oh, your head creepy. to the side, that's your creepy. eye just bulges out. So th these are huge problems to deal with. Well, even possible. if you manage to capture the ideal you know, shot of the person, you still deal with a lot of noise. So this is something else. Like, oh yeah, noise so is also. You know, I have an eye and I have this perfect measurement of Jason, the color of his eyes, the, Whatever beautiful, uh, <laughs> what color are they? You're okay. me out. Uh, uh, okay. Um, so you, you have a perfect representation of his eye. And you, you know, you're using ultimately some something to take a measurement of the scene right. to be able to do this. And we talked about like, oh, first of all, there's a problem of bit depth. Like I only have 256 levels to choose from and I have to represent everything in the scene. So challenge one. Challenge two is, you know, photons are falling in my sensor and I need to be able to measure them perfectly exactly. Right. Well, that just doesn't happen. Yep. So even if and even, even if, if you, you had a perfect number to represent it, you have to perfectly make that measurement, which would never happen. So if you had like think of you're looking at a plane, a whiteboard, a dry erase board, and you took a picture of a pure white erase board with perfect uniform lighting, none of this would happen, but it's all <laughs> perfect, right? And you try to take a picture of it, you're still not gonna get all white. You're gonna get right. some stuff that's slightly less white than other stuff and, and it's gonna have all these little variations in it just from the fact that you can't capture a perfect image of it you know right. or there might even be like what if there's a little dust in the air you yeah know, scattering that's exactly it. Or like heat waves could. coming up from the ground right like even if you could exactly measure exactly how many photons hit this spot the reality is it would be different because one photon bounces off a dust particle in the air and another fo two other photons collide and bounce off in a weird way and so there's always going to be a lot of noise no matter what and then that doesn't even yeah get into the aspect of like oh when you take a you're taking a picture it's not instantaneous you have to sit there and you know look at it for a little bit so this is a uh, you know you talked about like, shutter time shutter speed so even yeah. if there's not an actual shutter there's might be an electronic shutter but it's something to say how long to let the photons collect for right and that length of time the thing can move jason can blink <laughs> yeah. now his eyes are like half open half closed in my image like right. what the heck like oh now this is this is a problem for me right like and you have to deal with that yeah, yeah, and all of these image processing things. Yeah, and I mean, and, and the other problem too, another thing we should talk about is that all of these effects are cumulative. You know, if you if you have some algorithm that does edge detection, let's say, it's not going to be perfect. There's going to be some edge cases, things like that, and it's going to sort of introduce noise, and it's going to you're going to lose some of your information, right? And anything that runs on top of that is already at a disadvantage. And then it's also going to have introduced its own artifacts, right? And so the, all these artifacts are cumulative, 
And uh, that's one of the biggest challenges in image processing is knowing where in your pipeline you can get the most bang for your buck. Yep. All right. Well, we could go on for a long time about this. Yeah, but we'll, we'll done this talk for about a long time. <laughs> talk about some some tools. Yeah. So first one that I use, I'll talk about is OpenCV, which is Open Computer Vision. Yeah, it's an amazing library. There's a lot of history of this. I think it used to be an Intel product, and yeah. then it was open source, and it now, and it's uh, getting aside from the the there, background of it. There's a lot of plugin, not plugins, but uh, but uh, uh, wrappers. I think is what the right term. But you can write OpenCV. You can access OpenCV code from Java, Python, many of the yeah. Major so a lot libraries. of because it's basically a framework. So to represent images, we talked about like, oh, they're matrices. But there's a lot of common things you want to do, like, oh, I want to represent a convolution kernel. I want to represent yep. an image. I want to rep like all these different things. There's a common kind of way to do it. So part of what OpenCV is doing is like, oh, here's a common framework for doing that. Yep. But then, yeah, like Jason said, a lot of not only languages work with it, but a lot of people have written their you know university research paper in OpenCV. So they'll release like, oh, here's my yep. OpenCV code that does this crazy, you know, fancy whatever magic that you want it to do, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, or like, oh, here's an edge detector. Even they have things like, oh, here's something that if you take two images, it'll try to align them so that they, you know, kind of overlap correctly yep. because you had slight vibration in the camera between the two pictures. Yep. So, so things called, as complicated as that. That's called image registration. Yeah, when you have two images and you think that they're the same content, but one is maybe shifted or skewed or rotated, and you want to sort of come up with the transformation that puts them that aligns the two images, yeah. Right, so um, yeah, they all even have code as complicated for things like that. I don't think yep. they go as far as like having optical character recognition, OCR, or nope. like detecting but, cats, but the basis for that, you know, is yep. kind of in there. So they have several methods for transforming an image into a set of features, which is what, I, <laughs> we just learned this term, which is image analysis. They actually have several, fe several uh, uh, libraries that do that. So they have SIFT, which is scale invariant feature transform. They also have surf, which is similar to SIFT, is not as good, but it's um, high performance. I forgot the acronym stands for, but basically it does the same thing, but faster. For, so it's really meant for videos and processing just many frames of images. Um, and so if you need you know, to just take get an image and just turn it into a bunch of features for you to do something else with, OpenCV has all of that built in. Yeah. Yeah. So th there's also the Python imaging library? Yeah, so um, this uh, this one in, is in Python. It has a lot of sort of convolutions, these kind of things. It works with NumPy. So if you are a Python uh, user and you've needed matrices before, I'm sure you've used NumPy. Um, this is tightly integrated with that. And uh, it supports um, opening and saving files in many different formats, so. We already talked about MATLAB, Matrix Laboratory, but <laughs> yeah. you know, um, MATLAB, or I, I guess Octave has probably the... Oh, yeah, Octave has... Has that. image processing in as well. Yep. So one of the nice things about uh, my lab, Octave, is, in the image processing is, like, there's a lot of code to write, you know, if you're using a language which you don't have a good library for already, just yep. to, like, get to this, you know, array representation in the code is what it'll be, not a matrix, but an array. And so you have this array representation. Once you get there, there's a lot of fun you can do just to play around. But to get there, there's a lot of code. So having yeah. a batteries included something that does that or finding a good library to do it for you is a huge thing because you don't want to figure out how to, you know, it's not stored as just a list of numbers. There's always, there's like headers and there might be yeah. various compression and you gotta figure out how to undo all of this stuff to get back to your array of numbers. Yeah. And things like, you know, Python imaging library, MATLAB, OpenCVDs have those functions in them, which is really good because that stuff's interesting, but for me, that's not the part I wanted to play with when I started. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the other thing to know is if you aren't taking the video yourself, so in other words, you know, if you're recording a video on your camera, you can record the video even uncompressed, right? But you could also do, you know, MPEG-2 or MPEG-3 and you just know what it is. But if you want to just collect a bunch of videos from the internet, they could be encoded and each one could be encoded slightly differently. Like one you could be one could be MPEG4, one could be XVID, one could be uncompressed, and you want you want you don't want your image processing algorithm to be dependent on one of these input formats. So by using something like PIL or OpenCV or MATLAB, you just say, hey, take this image and turn it into a bunch of ones and zeros. Like I don't it's JPEG, it's PNG, it's MP4, I don't know what any of those mean, but I just want, you know, a matrix. And it will handle all that stuff. So the other other thing, and it's kind of a tool, kind of a, a 
you know, uh, whatever. Anyways, for, for photographers and, and images are taken with cameras, especially you have yeah. Photoshop and GIMP. Yep. And so this is still useful because like I said, there's things like Gaussian blur in there. You'll see that, or you can do things like run, like do edge detection. And it'll, you know, show you what the edges in the image are, which are transitions from dark to light or light to dark um, or colors or, but <clears throat> they'll have those kinds of things in there. So the one they're useful for like, oh, that's what that looks like really quickly. I wonder yeah. if that's what I want to implement or not. But even otherwise, sometimes if you want to pre-process your image in some way, so like, oh, I got this really dark image and I'd rather make it brighter because my algorithm works better that way, you know, sure, you probably should write something that does it automatically in your code, but initially you're not going to have that. So having something like GIMP or Photoshop, whenever I was doing image processing, I used these tools very heavily, yep, both for here. opening images and then like, oh, I want to crop it down to a power of two size because some algorithms want that. Like doing all those things, I don't want to write code to do that because it's typically a one-off yep. where I need to use human judgment to make something. And sure, a final system can't do that, but for testing and prototyping, you know, these tools are, are invaluable. Yeah, definitely. They're both awesome. Highly recommended. And then also, I guess if you get to become an image processing guru, you can contribute to GIMP or go work for Adobe and, and make the next Photoshop because they really have to do crazy stuff in there to implement all these things we talk about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's the latest Photoshop has this ridiculous stuff. Have you seen this magic eraser? No. It actually, it... Um, well, it uses a bunch of techniques, uh, really advanced techniques, but the idea is you can sort of erase something and it will blend in, it will replace it with, uh, you know, blended in of its uh, surroundings. I've seen this before, yeah, yeah, a uh, content aware Yeah, stuff. that's yeah. what it is. It's so like, thing. yeah, like, oh, I'm, I'm deleting something from grass so it knows to go find other grass and like stick it there from yeah. the image. Yeah, yeah, and it sort of keeps the frequencies intact and it keeps like L2 continuity, so it actually, like, you can't even tell that there was, you know, the pixels next to the Right, so there's a huge back. math research definition of it, but then ultimately, those people aren't using it. It's people who are like photographers saying like, oh man, there's like a, an ugly cockroach on this wall in this house, and I wanna just like, yeah, remove that cockroach. Like, he doesn't want to think about, hmm, I wonder what the gradient of this area <laughs> yeah, needs right. to be for... Uh, okay, gradient is actually an overloaded term there. That's <laughs> yeah. multiple meanings. So, okay, anyways, we'll, we'll skip on. <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty amazing. Photoshop, it gives a great way to start off. But uh, yeah, hopefully you'll make some of your own image processing algorithms and uh, share it with us. It'd be pretty cool. Yeah, it's a huge field. This is only a light glossing over, but mm -hmm. hopefully we've... Uh, enlighten someone or yeah definitely if you have at least entertain you for an hour if you have any questions about image processing um feel free to post it on the discussion on the on the um programming third round community so all right well, that's all i got cool have a good one guys see you next week next two weeks the intro music is axo by binar pilot Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.